Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. Round two of the Six Nations rugby featured an historic moment as Scotland hooker George Turner became the first player in the championship's history to be removed after his smart mouth guard detected a collision which could have caused a concussion. Headlines in The Times, The Daily Mail and The Guardian have called smart mouth guards a game changer in rugby's battle with concussion. The introduction of such technology, and particularly the removal of players from the field of play, hasn't been without controversy, and we're hoping to unpick some of that controversy a little today. I'm Dr Stuart McCurlane Naylor, and I'm joined by Dr Anara Leflau of the Ohio State University in the USA, and Dr Lizzie Williams and David Powell, both of Swansea University in the UK. Anora, Lizzie, David, welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast. Thank you, glad to be here. Great to have you all. I wondered, I don't know what order you want to go in, but just to start with, could you just give our listeners a really brief overview of your current roles and I guess your background in this area that we're going to be talking about today? I can start. Um, so my name is Enora Leflo. Um, I come from a mechanical engineering background. So I got a master's in mechanical engineering in France and then specialized in sports injury biomechanics. Then I went on to do a PhD in uh, New Zealand, where I really wanted to use head impact sensors to understand concussions. And then in that process, I realized that there were a lot of uncertainties with many of these aspects, like how to diagnose a concussion, how those that technology operate. And I decided to really focus on the technology itself. I wanted to do it with rugby, which was one of the attraction about New Zealand for me. Um, but ended up working with boxers and that has now become like my main research interest. And so I'm really interested in general what's to like, what are the strengths and weaknesses of those devices and really understanding how we can use them to answer the questions that we need to answer about concussions. So I'm Dr. Liz Williams. So I am currently a senior lecturer in sport and exercise science at Swansea University. My background is actually forensic science. So my PhD was in bloodstain pattern analysis and biomechanics of crime scene reconstruction. Due to a round, a random combination of circumstances, I ended up working in Silicon Valley for a big data tech company, SAP, where I got involved in the more big data analytics side of head impact telemetry when it was in its very early days. And that job led to this job that I have here, so Silicon Valley to the Valleys where I've been for the last seven years. And my research has really grown here into looking at head impact biomechanics in female sports, so particularly rugby union, because that's what happens a lot around here. So I've really come from this forensic background of applying injury mechanics principles to, to crime scenes, to using those same sort of principles in sports like rugby union to help understand injury mechanisms in live people, particularly females. So we found a lot of differences with females over the years. So that's really my key area at the moment. Hi, I'm David Powell. So I'm also from a mechanical engineering background, um, having done my master's at Swansea University. Um, following uh, that, I saw the opportunity for a PhD studying with Liz Williams. Um, so Dr. Williams, my supervisor, uh, focusing on the use of instruments and mouth guards um, in university sports and with a data-driven approach to um, improving the functionality and reliability um, of those devices. So um, at the minute, I've just uh, finished writing up my PhD thesis and, yeah, I'll be sitting a, a viva soon to uh, hopefully com complete the process. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. And, yeah, I think from Silicon Valley to the Valleys was my favourite quote in that. Um, but yeah, it might seem really obvious, but what is the rationale behind all of this? So why do we need to continuously monitor head impact during match play in these sports? So I think the real reason for me is that we need a tool that is objective because unfortunately concussion diagnosis is very much subjective and it can be fooled relatively easily. So players know what answers they need to give to a doctor if they want to go back to the game. And that's like not many competitor, like competitors will want to be put on the sideline because of a concussion. So 
we need an objective tool to identify when they are injured and when they need to be taken care of, when they need to recover to like protect them in the short and long term. And how has this previously been done then before these instrumented mouth guards came around? What was happening in recent history? When I first got involved in this whole area, it was all American football helmets. So when I was in California with SAP, we started looking at a concept for using the big data analytics platform to look at these American football helmets. And we started, you know, people had been doing this for approximately a decade prior to that in American football. So it was becoming more and more obvious that they were, while they were, it was a very important step in the development of where the head impact telemetry field is now. Anything in biomechanics, when you're measuring human motion, suffers from a coupling problems. So the, what the actual sensor is measuring has to be very, very well coupled to the body. So the actual thing that you're looking to measure to give valid and reliable data. So there were situations where helmets were flying off heads and recording data, which obviously wasn't what the head was doing. So then over time, that system, you know, the, 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 one of the companies in the States who were doing these American football helmets started doing patches. So um, IMU sensors, so inertial motion unit sensors, which are a combination of accelerometers, gyroscopes and magnetometers, were being put into little plastic um, patches which were being stuck to the mastoid process behind the ear. So that was, it was a direct connection to the head, but it was sitting on the skin. And while it was a bony prominence, any bony landmark, any, when in biomechanics, we, we talk about bony landmarks being the repeatable um, places which, which minimize soft tissue artifact where we put sensors, whether they be IMUs or um, optical sensors. But these, anything on the skin suffers from skin artifact or soft tissue artifact. So you do still have a lot of motion of the skin underneath the sensor, which causes big, um, you know, errors in the data. So there was a paper by, and all right, you probably know the, the values off the top of your head, by Lindia Wu in, I think, 2017, which quantified the error around 53%, I think it was, in some cases. So you, you do have a lot of, and we've written a paper ourselves um, more recently about characterizing soft tissue artifact and is it possible to predict it? I mean, there's lots of things you can do to minimize it with post-processing, but ultimately it's not predictable enough to, um, to really get an accurate measure of what the skull is doing. So it's the skull that you want to measure. So the actual solid part of your head. So there are, well, the ways to do this would have been either drilling into the skull, which you can't do in live people, um, something to do with ethics, or having having the sensors coupled really tightly to the top teeth. So the top teeth move as part of your skull with very, very little soft tissue artifacts. So there's still some, but it's very, very minimal. And the better the fit, so the smaller the components get, which has happened over the last, especially five years or even even more recently than that, that the size of the actual sensors, the componentry that goes with it, and the batteries um, have become so small now that it's possible to have a very tight fit um, mouth guard, which will move with the teeth with very minimal shaking. So the more recent additions of the mouth guards have a proximity sensor. So it differs for different brands, but usually it's an infrared sensor which will tell you how well it's stuck to the teeth during the impact so how much it, how much the guard moves additional to the teeth while the actual impact's being recorded so that will give if it's if it's constantly really bad it means the guard's not fit very well so the data is going to be a bit questionable so that's um that's pretty much where that technology is now so if you go back even further than the you know the 10 years um, people started measuring head impact stuff for military applications and were in American football back in the 60s where the technology they had was considerably bigger than it is now. So um, I've been reading papers that were published back in the in the 1960s, early 1970s, talking about like three to five thousand um, G-force values going through a head, which, of course, is not possible. It's just because of the 
the way that you, the measurement techniques that you use will dictate what the data is going to turn out like. Yeah, it's, it's funny because the, the idea of monitoring head impacts is definitely not new. I remember also seeing some papers from like 1987, I think, where you could see like on the videos, or not on the videos, but on the photos in the paper, you could see like a massive scaffolding, like above a boxing ring because researchers had to stand above the ring to hold the cables from the accelerometers that were placed on boxers' heads so that it wouldn't get in the way. So obviously the technology has evolved like a lot and we're now in a position to like do some relatively good measurements on field. Um, I'd like to add to what Lizzie just said that in parallel of like developing the technology, um, sports have developed methods to identify concuss players as well. So in rugby specifically, the head injury assessment, so the HIA assessment has been like the norm for many years now. And they use, um, for example, spotters and doctors on the sideline that identify when a player sustain like a, a big looking head impact. So like show signs of concussion that are used to like trigger that assessment. And the mouth guards right now are really just adding to that existing process. OK, so with the mouth guard now, then, is that a replacement for that assessment happening on the side of the pitch? Or is it a replacement for visually noticing signs of a concussion and thinking that somebody needs to be assessed on the side of the pitch? Um, right now, it's an addition. So to my knowledge, nothing has been changed to the HIA process itself, but they're just adding one layer of identify, of potential identification of a concuss player. So what happens is that well, rugby has come up with some thresholds based on that acceleration that the head goes through to the, the amount of motion of the head after an impact. They found some threshold from years of research that they've done before to identify when a player might need to be assessed. One thing that I think is very important to understand is that these thresholds are not based on potential injury or on like tolerance thresholds to brain trauma. They are really based on like what is the threshold that is going to trigger one additional head injury assessment per game. So they want to try to better identify players without putting too much pressure on the medical staff and without having like without taking the risk of having too many false positives um, in this new data set. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. And I think that I might have come on to this a bit later on, but I think that idea of false positives and false negatives is a really interesting one to dig into a bit further. So, yeah, how, obviously one. we don't want to miss a real concussion, but then if you make it you know, really sensitive so that anything that could possibly be a concussion, you're removing players off of the pitch, that then has its own negative consequences. So, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that balance of false positives, false negatives, where we go with that. It's um, um, a tricky one to answer, I think. I guess it's a case of identification, isn't it? You, there's always going to be issues with the devices. There's always going to be uh, issues with the identification of concussion. Um, but I suppose it's just, yeah, I think for now it's probably going to be a data gathering exercise in which these tolerances need to be updated and become more accurate. Because I, truth be told, I don't know the exact numbers and I don't know the exact number of data that the um, current thresholds have been derived from. But there are so many factors to a specific person's tolerance to acceleration. There's so many factors, um, you know, that can change very quickly that it's um, a metric that's going to need to be updated quickly, in my belief. Additionally, as well, the metrics used, you know, they, they will also be able to be refined in the future as well, because um, not all 60G impacts are equal as well. And there's, there could be factors that um, can be analysed, such as the duration of acceleration over certain thresholds, the sort of um, the impulse of the impact that could play a major part into this um, and allow for more accurate thresholds to be set in the future. And do we know then, if we forget about instrumented mouth guards for a moment, if we could actually measure force on the brain or acceleration of the brain, which I know we can't, but what 
would we want to measure? What is it that actually causes concussion? Do we know that? Kind of is it peak force or impulse or a repetitive number of smaller impacts over the course of a game? I'm not a neurologist, but I do work with some who are particularly brilliant at this. And from what I understand as a non-neurology person, traditionally all the head and head injury, brain injury models, equations were derived purely from acceleration, linear acceleration. So from what I understand, the linear acceleration has been associated with these changes in the pressure gradient through the brain with, you know, the, the brain moving. But more specifically, and this is papers from um, Robert Stern and McKee, is when you have these rotational, quite high rotational impacts. So in American football, in rugby is a particularly rotational game. You have your hemispheres, overly simplistic explanation, hemispheres oscillating against one another. So you have the force being propagated down through the forks, and then you have the connection center of your brain is the corpus callosum. So you have these connections going between the hemispheres in the callosum, the corpus callosum itself, which is right in the middle of the brain. So from what we've seen from these papers, you have these hemispheric rotation. So you have the shearing and tearing of these axons down in the middle of the brain, so the connection center of the brain. That's where the most of the atrophy is seen when, when they publish these cross sections of the brain after, you know, during autopsy. So the wastage of the, like, sort of like a, a muscle wastage when you stop using it. So around the middle area of the brain, that's one of the, the things that has come out of that, that I've read in these neuropathology papers is the damage to the corpus callosum itself, so the communication centre of the brain, the interhemispheric connection centre, because of the stretching, tearing. Rather than the outside of the brain um, in those early contra kind of concussion diagrams that you see with, like, say, bruising just on the frontal lobe. So that's my understanding of that. For me, at least, that reminds me of a lot of the talk around, say, external and internal training load monitoring or a lot of wearable technology based work saying, how can we estimate what's happening inside the body from measures being taken outside the body? And I guess it's a lot of those familiar challenges. But for anyone who I guess is somewhat familiar with how these mouth guards work, how does what Lizzie just described internal within the brain relate in any way to the things that we're actually measuring so are we just measuring linear accelerations or are we measuring linear and rotational aspects and how does that i guess link in with what we know about the internal mechanisms linked to concussion that we've just discussed so <clears throat> with the mouth gas we can measure the motion of the head or the motion of the skull like actually the motion of the sensor that we use as an estimation of the motion of the skull, which some people have now been working for like a few years on um, numerical models of the head and brain. So um, I don't know how familiar the audience will be with finite elements, but it's basically some like numerical technique that allows to measure the deformation of like very tiny elements that would constitute the brain. And so by using the kinematics, like so the measures from the mouth guards, into those head and brain models, we can actually try to estimate the the strain and the stress on each on each part of the brain. And so that relates to exactly what Lizzie was saying um, about the actual like mechanical damage. So there are models that are in development to better understand that. Um, it still hasn't it's still very much a work in progress, but I think the field is moving towards that beyond um, the peak acceleration of the head. So that's something that is very promising for the future of the field. OK, and then I assume then from what you've said, we're not saying if it goes, any of these measures go above a certain threshold, you are going to be concussed. It's more there's some uncertainty involved in it and it's almost a risk factor of if something is triggered, then this person potentially needs looking at in more detail. Does anyone know in the applied sense how that is working? As in, I've obviously seen headlines of players being removed from matches. Is that 
if a threshold is exceeded, players are then removed for the rest of the match or a set period of time? Or is it they're removed for further assessment that then determines whether they go back onto the field or not? And I guess linked in with all of that, if there are any answers for any of this, how might that change the role of some of the clinicians or other people involved in that setup in any way? So um, it's pretty early days. So it's January the 1st, 2024 this year that um, World Rugby mandated the use of instrumented mouth guards for the professional teams. Um, actually, I think it's been a bit longer with the women's game. I think it started in October last year for the women's game. And somehow you- we don't hear about women's rugby. <laughs> I, I only follow women's rugby. Um, yeah, no, they did these in the WXV last year. That was the first time. But so the mandate was January the 1st, 2024 for all professional teams worldwide. So as I understand it, um, there was an or- orchard study so done in New Zealand over the last few years. So this was done you know, in conjunction with World Rugby, so led by Danielle Salmon and Melanie Bussey. And so they cre- they collected instrumented mouth guard data for a big number of elite and community level teams. From that data, they took a value over which only, I think it was 1% of impacts happened. Um, a very small percentage of um, impacts were over this particular threshold. So that's where they started. So I think they started um, with, the, with the Women's Championship last year at 50G, um, but that you know didn't work. So they, had to, they brought it up to 60, and now I think it's 70G for... Um, the um for the six nations and 75 for the pacific super rugby i'm not sure exactly but those thresholds have have changed so they were they were based on um statistics done from the otago study and been refined from there and they will have to be refined further so it's not to say that's so that's those so 60 or 70 g in four and a half or four thousand rads per second per second or four and a half thousand which i think it is now they're not based on whether or not somebody's brain is going to um, experience injury at those forces, it's based on a probability that that's only going to happen for one in every, I don't know, something like a thousand impacts that they've recorded, if I've understood that correctly. I wonder as well in relation to all of this, what value there is in sub threshold data. I know this is a very developing field and as you say, Things are changing, thresholds are changing, people are starting to learn how to make effective use of it. But I wonder whether anybody knows of this being used in training and not just competition and whether there is you know, scope for monitoring sub threshold impacts over the period of a day or a week or a month or a season and whether anything can be done with that data not just the kind of one time all season when it does exceed a big threshold. Yeah, yeah, I know there are quite a few teams using this in training to over to quantify the overall load, so the like workload. So as if you'd use a GPS in training to quantify how many meters you run, how many high intensity meters you run and your overall workload. Um these Mouth guards, all different brands are being used in training for various teams to do that same thing, but with head impacts. So quantifying, you know, the number of head impacts at a certain, at a certain intensity and the overall number of impacts, you know, right down to the bottom thresholds, which depending on, I was talking to David about this yesterday, the minimum, the, you know, where, what the trigger threshold is. So is it triggered over 60 or over 10 G and why? So how, you know, how many, impacts they're getting down that bottom end and the cumulative um, overall exposure there. So using those to limit and mitigate the chances of, of brain injury from limiting to the, the exposure in in training. Yeah, I think one of the key things here is that we still don't really know what those data points mean um, because we don't have that connection between acceleration of the head to brain strains to brain trauma already. So right now we can't really use those like absolute values to identify when someone is injured or when someone needs care. Um, but it can still be used to like 
identify, for example, where the, whether there's like a type of drill or like a type of training session that generates more head impacts on players, or there's like some players that for whatever reason sustain more head impacts than others for the same playing positions and like identifying whether there's like like a technique improvement that needs to be made to protect them or whether there's like some like changes into the like um into like the schedule of the training sessions to adapt for like higher contact load um sessions so there are still things that can be used uh for player welfare and we're like really much still learning about it. And some, yeah, as Lizzie said, some teams, some clubs are working independently of researchers and I'm not involved with any clubs and I would love to see how it's being used, um, in clubs to like know what they're doing, how they're using it, what are the benefits to the player? What do, what do the player think the benefits for them are? I think would be very interesting. What we're doing here at Swansea University. So we've got three women's teams currently kitted out with instrumented with these instrumented mouth guards. What we found, so a paper that we published in 2021, we instrumented our men's and women's first rugby teams with instrumented mouth guards to compare. I wanted to look at sex differences, but of course we learned a lot more from that than we originally thought we would. So we were looking at, I was looking for sex differences and how head impacts are sustained. So this, these, this mouth guard technology has enabled, you know, these findings and, and the implications from those findings are a lot wider than, than, you know, we expected. So we found just looking at the mouth guard data over the course of a season. So that season was cut short for COVID. So it was only seven games per team, but there was no, if we just looked at the data by itself, there was no overall statistical difference in the magnitudes of head impacts sustained by the women's team and the men's team throughout that season. However, coupled with video analysis, which you have to do anyway, what we saw were completely different mechanisms between these two teams. So we thought, oh, sex differences, right? So we found that as we found a lot of, like one of the most common mechanisms for the women's team was this head to ground impact, but it wasn't just head to ground like you see in the professional men. It was an, it was an uncontrolled whiplash, like a car crash, head to ground, right? So, you know, that, and that was very stark difference between the men's and the women's team. So the men, we only saw that maybe twice in a season and once was when the guy got knocked out first. But the women, we saw it right throughout every game, right? Then you dive a little deeper. You think, oh, that, that's interesting. So we, we tested everybody's neck strength. We've got these big neck strength machines that we've made here behind me. The women did have a 47% difference in absolute neck strength. That's not corrected for body weight. That's just 47% difference. But if you're just looking at outright measures, you know, so there's that. But then the average playing age for the men, so everything else was very comparable. So similar ages, very similar ages, similar background demographics, all from similar areas of wherever they are in the UK, Wales, England. But one group was female, one group were male. The males had an average playing age of 13.5 years. But the men's team, the women's team had an average playing age of 3.5 years. So while we were getting all excited and concerned about these sex differences that we'd found because of the mouth guards, I, we, we even started going, hang on a minute, one team are kind of semi-professional slash academy level players who have been playing for most of them over a decade. They started when they were five, between five and ten. The other team, uh, a lot of them couldn't play rugby through school because it didn't exist for them. So they've started playing rugby at university. They've done three training sessions and they're playing against national team ranks. So is that a sex difference or have we just made a really obvious connection between playing experience and opportunities for for girls to get involved in rugby and the kinds of head impacts that we're seeing. So then we had some students and collaborators from other places look at the professional women. So look at the black phones and look at England and you don't see the out of control head impact to ground in those teams or France. In fact, at the World Cup, I saw just, I was just there on the sideline. We saw it in Canada, the Canadian team who ended up fourth at the World Cup and the teams going down from that. I did see it quite a lot. The first, those first two, three teams. So England, New Zealand and France, hardly any at all. That suggests it's not a sex difference, really, is it? It's um, more to do with your, the expertise 
you know, the, the, your the experience that you have playing rugby and the expertise of the coaching that you've had all that time. So those mouth guards have given us all of these really cool insights that we're now, you know, using to improve things. I really like that idea as well of combining multiple data sources to say, actually, how can we get more insight by combining instrumented mouth guards with video? As you said, potentially you've got GPS data, you've got whatever else. How can all of those combined give even more insight? And on that note as well of things maybe being not quite what they first seem or digging into it a bit more and I guess finding out more than was first expected. Are there any common myths or misconceptions around the use of instrumented mouth guards or anything, whether it's something you've seen in the media or something you've seen on social media or just anything you're aware of where people are generally misunderstanding how these things are used and how they work that you might be able to try and educate us on or help people to understand a bit better that we haven't already done so? Well, I, I suppose the um, the main thing you see is um, when you're looking at comments and articles and that sort of stuff is, is always uh, the phrase sort of concussion detection is the one that I think people are getting most excited about. And that's the sort of, um, yeah, I think that's what people somewhat expect um, from the devices, perhaps. Um, I think, yeah, the, the mo most important thing to know is that probably is that's the, probably the long term aim of instruments and mouth guard use and probably the gold standard, the sort of like platinum goal would be to achieve a device, to create a device or software that can achieve that sort of um, level of sort of accuracy and insight. But I think at this moment in time, it's fair to say that's a long way off, but the eventual aim of the device. And if that's the long term aim, what do we need to do, whether it's as researchers, practitioners, the kind of scientific community, the sporting community? What are the steps to get there or what would you like to see from research over the next few years to help us bridge that gap? Um, so, yeah, with with anything related to data science and machine learning and those sort of projects, the, the answer uh, to that question is always more data. Um, so the I think the yeah to, to to achieve these kind of things, you really you really need a sort of um, glut of data. You need lots of data which is high quality and accessible by many researchers as well to explore different avenues and explore different different relationships between the data and the actual um, at like uh, outcomes. So, yeah, I think that the, the main way to achieve or to make fast progress in the field is to make data available to people, um, along with in an ideal world video footage and labels regarding uh, what actually occurred in the data and what was the outcome of those impacts. Um, because yeah, there's going to be a lot of complex relationships to investigate between um, the sort of number of impacts, the types of impacts, the accumulation of impacts and those things before we can start really getting um, uh, those sort of outcomes from the mouth guards, like those insights that people sort of hope for, of looking for concussion detection and those kind of things. So yeah, in in summary, it's just as with a lot of things, more more data is required. Yeah, I I completely agree. I think more data is needed, and that's one thing that World Rugby is going to get from that mandate, no matter what. They're going to get tons and tons of data, so that's going to help. Um, I think the one one thing as well is that. Even if concussions are common, they're not that common. So collecting like head impacts from instrumented mouth guards that actually lead to concussions takes a long time. And mouth guards are not cheap either, so it takes a lot of money as well. So there's a lot of like logistical issues to getting more data. I think one of the things that we need to do if we want to use instrumented mouth guard to identify concussion is understand how concussions happen. And we have a lot of ground to cover there. Um, but so I, I, I would personally like to see more research onto like the cumulative effects of head impacts. Cause right now we usually look at concussions in terms of like one big impact that makes the player show clear signs of concussion, but we don't really understand still how all these little impacts that a player sustained before actually influence that big impact and so we think that concussions is a result of like smaller impacts and big impacts and like anything in between but we don't really understand it yet in, in addition to all of those things there's so many other 
variables. So what we're doing currently, what we're trying to do, and this is really, I sort of, this is really hard to integrate all these different data sources. So we are doing this project with, with university level women's rugby, looking at how does net strength affect, relate, relate to the impacts that you see on the field? How does, what we wanted to look at was how menstrual cycle affects A, how you get injured and B, how you respond to that. But we had to take that out. Um, we were asked to take that out, which is incredibly disappointing. But we're also looking at not just the SCAT 6 for neurocognitive responses, but a series of more bespoke neurocognitive tests that are being, that part of it's being led by Dr. Genevieve Williams from Exeter. So our aim with this was to have really clear, or develop, or try to develop really clear correlations between the actual cumulative, um, you know, head impact exposure that we're measuring through these mouth guards throughout the, you know, week game season and how these neurocognitive responses changed over that time. But unable to get that data, you need full buy-in from everybody involved. And of course, everybody's got their own lives and these players aren't professional. They don't, their medics aren't full time, you know. So it's been, it's, it's been a real challenge to coordinate all of these data streams together. Um, it remains a big challenge. So that, I mean, ultimately we need to have this cross pollination of our know, research designs need to include the neurology side, um, the, you know, neurocognitive experts in that area along with the biomechanists looking at the the impacts as you know we're trying to but also you know with female athletes having having to take out the menstrual cycle monitoring was a was yeah, a hugely disappointing part of our study we don't really know how the the changes in the hormonal profile affect these concussions because there's been one or two studies one in 2014 that that found that having a concussion in the luteal phase of your menstrual cycle was correlated with longer and more severe post-concussion symptoms. But it's so hard to gather that data. You really need people that know what they're doing with the whole change in hormonal profile. Um, you need those people. You need to write that into your study design and you need the funding, which is really hard to get because, you know, it's periods, women, people tend not to, people with money tend not to, really understand the importance of that. So you, it's, it is, we've found it quite difficult to get, to get funding to even look at it. Um, so we, well, we've got so far to go, um, in understanding even, even just those individual parts of it, let alone how all of these, all of these components interrelate and how they, how one thing affects the other. As you say, with the one thing they're definitely going to get, at least at the elite level, is lots of data by mandating it. Are there any legal consequences or what are the kind of moral, ethical concerns around, I guess, the use of players' data? And do players have any say in what data can and can't be used for? Or is that a bit of a controversial question? I can only speak for our for the study that I've directly involved in. And no, the, the data is only only accessible to the researchers named on our ethics document. There'd be nobody looking at that until it's in a generalised form for publication where there won't be any identifiable features. We can only report, you know, this this is a standard thing. In the pro leagues, I really don't know. I'm not involved in that part of it. I don't know about, like, any legal... um uh, consequences of it, but I know it's a bit different here in the U.S. Whether, well, if you obtain funding that comes from the government, so from the National Institute of Health or the Department of Defense, for example, they are funding a lot of concussion-related studies. Um, you have to make your data publicly available, uh, not available for like like members of the general public, but available to researchers that have a specific research questions that could potentially be answered by those data. So we, we have to make some of that, like some of those results and some of those data available, which I think is a great thing to move the field forward. Do we think all of this is coming to many more sports as well now? If we talk about how World Rugby have taken up the mandated use of instrumented mouth guards, 
do we think similar things are likely to be coming for other sports or are there lessons here that other sports can learn from rugby? I think it's actually very funny because like the, this whole field started, as Lizzie said before, with American football and with ice hockey and other like helmeted sports because that was what the technology allowed. And then since instruments and mouth guards, like rugby took over and like they've been really like, I think, leading the fields and they've like studied some like very, very big studies compared to what has been seen here in the US where it's mostly like little research teams that do research on their local football or college team while well, rugby has like refunded really like large massive studies that I think are taking everything forward. I think a lot of sports might want to wait to see what world rugby comes with and like what are the results and how the mouth guards are like used and maybe validated and accepted by all of the stakeholders before going forward. But I think it was like, like a, a first, like never seen before kind of mandate um, from world rugby. In Nora, do you know, so I've read a few years ago and this, this might not still be the case that there was only one insurance company in the whole of the US who would actually insure American football. So Pop Warner, NCAA and the NFL. Do you know if that's still the case? Because if we're being really transparent about the kinds of impact forces and the cumulative impact forces that people, so in the case of professional players that employees are sustaining, do you think that's going to have any implications for particular leagues being able to get insurance? I honestly have no idea. Um, I, I don't think I've been in the States long enough to know that. And that's not something that we've had that we came across in my studies here. Um, one thing that I can tell you related to insurance and the way that it like the health system works in the US is that the number of concussion is definitely like underestimated. Like, I know we have a lot of, like, I work with combat sport athletes and we have several people that do not have insurance. And even if they are, like, clearly concussed after a fight, they will not want to, to go to the doctor because they can't pay for it. But that's, that's really the only thing that I know about the whole health insurance thing here. And I know we're coming to a close in terms of time, but if anyone listening to this, is really interested in this area of either concussions, instrumented mouth guards, impact related sports, etc. Is there any way you can recommend that people can find out either more about your own research or more about this topic in general? I know I like if people want to find out more about my work, uh, I am a little bit active on X or Twitter, uh, so people can find me there. I'm also like more than happy to like answer question via email um, if people want to. David's published a really promising, exciting paper from his PhD. His PhD viber is actually tomorrow, and there's two more papers coming out of that PhD in the, in the, I'm like looking at him going, yes, they will be, won't they, um, in the short term. So David, do you want to talk about those a little bit, the papers, because this is really where the, where the future of this field needs to go. Yeah, I can I can give a quick um a quick overview. Um, so we're just um on on the topics of the, the thesis, we're mainly been looking at improving the reliability and functionality of instrumented mouth guards. Um, because there's been a lot of focus with the use of mouth guards, sort of at the, the pinnacle of sports, where they have much greater resources than most users will be able to access. Um, so part of it's been to try and create tools that you know, could be usable to researchers at any level of the game. So um, allowing you to verify your own impacts with you have less resources like cameras and staff available to yourself and trying to make the um, predictions from the mouth guards as accurate as possible. Because um, one consideration we found with the mouth guard data is that um, it's always it's the report of the magnitudes aren't bespoke to the wearer, which is something that could factor into the the magnitude, um, so using the fil filtering the impacts for danger by magnitude. Uh, we did a study where we found that these could vary by about 20%, but greater than 20% per person. So you could see the exact same impact 
uh, when translated to a point of interest, say, in the brain for someone so sort of that magnitude you're then reporting as like your you know, impact size could vary by 20 percent from one person to another person. So that impact, which is reported at 59 G for one person could, um, and therefore not an impact of interest could actually be a 71, 72 G impact in another person uh, when translated to that correct location. Um, and yeah, the, the rest of the work is then um, tr- trying to extract more information, um, which I hope would be a useful tool as well going in the future. So looking at what uh, what mechanisms are actually causing head acceleration. So using machine learning algorithms to try and predict the action that a person was conducting, whether it was a tackle or a carry or um, the actual impact type of direct contact ahead or indirect contact ahead to try and sort of continually provide extra data richness, which I believe could then be used to in further analytics down the line in terms of um, finding where impacts are coming from or finding yeah the source of impacts. And therefore, you could yeah expand that out to find out the source of injury as well, I suppose. You can tell you're prepared for your visor with a nice, succinct summary of the last three years or however many years of research. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Anora and Lizzie, massive thank you for sharing all of your knowledge. David, thank you for sharing yours and a massive good luck for your PhD by the tomorrow. Hopefully by the time this comes out and people are actually listening, that will all have gone well. And yeah, it might be Dr. Powell by that point. Um, but yeah, massive good luck and thanks again to everyone. Thanks for listening to the Experts in Sport podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, then please contact me, Martin Foster at m.foster at Thanks for listening. See you next time.